Psychological Association 1986 Annual Meeting. This is session number 37, 29786, Divisions 2, 1, 15, 25, and 26, Invited Address. Programmed Instruction Revisited. The presenter... ...from Presses in several important ways. First, students came to it without having studied anything. They were not being tested, they were being taught. Second, they composed their responses, they did not choose them. That is the difference between a reading and a speaking knowledge of a second language. One can take, make an excellent score in a multiple choice test of a second language, even when one cannot speak it well at all. A similar difference between reading mathematics and speaking mathematics is less obvious, but more important. It is the difference most of us once felt when we followed easily enough as the author of a text solved a sample problem and we then tried to solve other problems by ourselves. Third, Pressy's machine simply gave an immediate evaluation of each response. The items in my machine were arranged in a special order. After completing the material in frame one, students were better able to tackle frame two and their behavior became steadily more effective as they passed from frame to frame. I began to speak of programmed instruction. Composing answers by moving sliders um, was perhaps good enough for simple arithmetic or spelling, but it was, not, it was too slow and awkward for most of the things I wanted to teach. And I designed a different machine in which 30 frames of a program uh, printed radially on a large disk, uh, one frame shows through, the, or through an opening in the machine. The student writes a response on a strip of paper in another opening, and by lifting a lever, the student moves what has been written under a transparent cover, but it could not be changed, and uncovers the correct response. In 1958, 12 of these machines were set up in a self-instruction room in Seaver Hall in the Harvard Yard, and were used in my course, Natural Sciences, 114. James G. Holland and I wrote the program, which was eventually published in workbook form. That's all for the slides. We could have the lights on, please. That sort of thing can also now be done much more conveniently with computers, of course. The machines I have described are museum pieces, and appropriately enough, are all now in the Smithsonian. I was soon saying that with the help of teaching machines and programmed instruction, students could learn twice as much in the same time and with the same effort as in their classrooms. Other kinds of machines soon appeared, and some of them responses were chosen as in Pressy's machine, and others they were composed as in mine. Great numbers of programs were written, most of them published in workbook form with current responses being uncovered by a sliding mask or found on another page. By the end of 1962, according to an editorial in Science, 250 programmed courses would be available in elementary, secondary, and college mathematics, 60 in science, 25 in electronics and engineering, 25 in foreign languages, and 120 in social studies. Many were excellent. A colleague once told me, that he had decided that he ought to know more about biochemistry and had, brought, had bought a programmed text. It was amazing, he said, in a week I knew biochemistry. He didn't mean, of course, that he was then a biochemist, but that he had learned a great deal with very little effort in a remarkably short period of time. Program instruction, with or without machines, was quickly adopted by industry but the educational establishment was not impressed. It was as if the automobile industry had been shown how to build cars in half the time at half the cost and had said no. Reasons could be given, of course. The machines were crude, the programs were untested, and there were no ready standards of, of, of comparison. Machines would have cost money that was not already budgeted. Administrators, school boards, and parents would have to agree on their adoption, and teachers misunderstood the role of the machines and were afraid of losing their jobs. Two administrative problems, however, 
would have caused much more serious trouble. What would happen if students really learned twice as fast? If first grade students also covered second grade material, what would the second grade teacher do? How soon would students come on the job market? That problem, of course, could have been solved by teaching twice as much. Surely a happy solution, but it would have meant retraining teachers, restocking libraries and storerooms and making many other changes. Even more disruptive would have been the inevitable abandonment of the phalanx system. If each student could advance at his or her own pace, how were students to be grouped? What would happen to the homeroom? It would be unfair to say that teaching machines and program instruction were not more quickly adopted because improvement in education would cause too much trouble. A more likely obstacle was a failure to understand the principles upon which they were based. A change was needed in educational psychology, and it was delayed by an accident of the time. When the Russians put the first man-made satellite into orbit, Americans were stunned. How could the Russians have beaten us with something wrong with American education? The National Defense Education Act was quickly passed and money was made available to improve teaching, especially in science and mathematics. A conference of educators was held at Woods Hole to plan its use and was reported in Jerome Bruner's the process of education, which became a kind of Bible in schools of education. Students were no longer to be told things, they were to discover them for themselves. They were not to memorize, they were to think, grasp concepts, be creative. Vast sums of money were spent in developing materials to improve high school science teaching. Students would also no longer add, subtract, multiply, and divide. That kind of thing could be done by hand calculators. They would think as mathematicians thought with the help of the new math. 25 years later, high school grades in science and mathematics were a little worse. Those who had prepared the materials blamed the teachers, but it was the teachers and their problems which had needed help in the first place. The cognitive movement seemed to legitimatize traditional theories of learning and teaching. Many educators were content with such a book as William James' Talk to Teachers, which was published in 1899 and written in the language of the layman. Program instruction, on the other hand, took advantage of what had been discovered in a special discipline called the Experimental Analysis of Behavior. My first programs were written when I was finishing an application of that analysis to verbal behavior. By carefully constructing certain contingencies of reinforcement, it is possible to change behavior quickly and to maintain it in strength for long periods of time. The details cannot be covered here, but I can illustrate the central process by telling a story. The process is called operant conditioning, of course. Many years ago, I published a paper in Scientific American called How to Teach Animals. The editors of Look Magazine found it hard to believe and challenged me. If I could teach an animal as swiftly as I said I could, they wanted pictures. I accepted the challenge. I would teach a dog to stand on his hind legs in a matter of minutes. I would not touch the dog. I would not attract his attention in any way. I would not give it any reason to stand up, such as holding a piece of meat above its head. I would simply reinforce its behavior. Some preparation would be needed. A reinforcer is most powerful when it follows behavior very quickly, optimally within a fraction of a second. Giving a dog a bit of meat is too slow. The dog must see the meat and come and get it, and that takes time. For essentially instantaneous reinforcement, a conditioned reinforcer is needed. In my article, I had explained how to condition the sound of a clicker as a reinforcer. But since we were going to take pictures, 
I would use the camera flash. To look people were to buy a dog and give it its daily ration in the following way. When the dog was moving about the room, they were to operate the flash and then give it a bit of meat. It would soon respond to the flash by coming to be fed, and when, after a day or two, it did so instantly, I would take over. When I first saw the dog, I took the switch that operated the flash and told the photographer to keep his camera on the dog. I had put some horizontal lines on one wall of the room, and when the dog went near them, I flashed the light. It came to the look reporter to be fed and went back near the lines, predictably because I had just reinforced going there. Starting across the head of the dog, I chose a line somewhat above its normal position and reinforced the first movement that brought the head that high. When the dog returned from being fed, its head was already noticeably higher, and I could then choose a higher line. As I moved from line to line, the dog's four feet began to come off the floor, and it was soon standing straight up, QED. Since there was some meat left, however, I continued this differential reinforcement until the dog was leaping straight up, its hind feet nearly a foot off the floor. A picture had been taken of each flash, with each flash, of course, and look published, one showing the final spectacular leap. You will not find a correct account of what I had done in most introductory texts in psychology, even today. Some of them will say, that I had rewarded the dog for its jumping. As the etymology shows, however, the reward is compensation or remuneration for services performed and is seldom immediately contingent on behavior. We reward people, behavior we reinforce. Other texts would say that the dog had learned by trial and error, but it was not trying to do anything when it lifted its head. I could have selected a lower position and got the dog on, down on, this, on the floor. And it certainly did not learn anything from errors. Some texts would call lifting the head or standing up purposive or goal-directed behavior. But a goal has no effect on the behavior through which it is reached. Only past consequences have any effect. Many educators would say that what I had done was training, not teaching. But if so, it was very much improved training. Dogs have been trained for centuries, and there are useful rules of thumb. But it is highly unlikely that even the most expert animal trainer could have done so much in such a short period of time with conventional means. Teaching is more than training, but it uses the same behavioral processes. Of course, we seldom teach in just that way. We do not teach a boy to tie a knot by conditioning a reinforcer, giving the boy two pieces of string, and reinforcing any move that happens to contribute to the fashioning of a knot. Instead, we show him how to tie a knot. We model the behavior, and he imitates us. But why should he do so? Before we can show him how to tie a knot, he must have learned to imitate, and he will have done so through operant conditioning. Because the vocal musculature of the human species has now come under operant control, we can also tell him how to tie a knot. And in that case, the need for an acquired operant repertoire is even more obvious. Showing and telling are ways of priming behavior of getting a response, the person to respond in a given way for the first time so that the behavior can be reinforced. We do not learn by imitating, however, or because we are told what to do. Consequences must follow. Consider how most of us learn to drive a car. At first, we turned the starting switch when we saw our instructor do so. We pressed the brake pedal when he or she said press and so on. But the moves we made had consequences. When we turned the switch, the engine started. When we pressed the brake pedal, 
the car slowed or stopped. Those were natural consequences, and they were more closely contingent upon our behavior than were those flashes on the behavior of the dog. They eventually shaped skillful driving. As long as we were responding to instruction, the car moved, but we were not driving it. We learned how to drive in the sense of driving well, only when the contingencies of reinforcement maintained by the car took over. We do not learn by doing, as Aristotle said. We learn when what we do has reinforcing consequences. To teach is to arrange such consequences. The same two stages occur in learning to talk about things. Someone primes our behavior either by saying something that we repeat or writing something that we read. And we learn when reinforcing consequences then follow. For a time, our behavior may need to be prompted, but as it gains in strength, the prompts can be withdrawn or vanished in the sense in which a magician vanishes the bouquet of flowers. The roles of priming, prompting, and vanishing are especially clear in teaching or learning. My daughter Deborah once came home from school complaining that she had been assigned memorizing 15 lines of Longfellow's Evangeline. Those are very long lines, she complained. I told her I would show her how she could learn them easily. I wrote the lines on a blackboard and asked her to read them. When I, then I erased a few words and asked her to read them again. She did so correctly, in spite of the omissions. When I erased a few more words, she could still read them. After five or six erasures, she read them all, although there was nothing on the blackboard. At first, the words were primes. By reading them, she engaged in the required behavior, but not yet for the right reasons. The, more, the words left, out from on, left on the board functioned as slowly vanishing prompts. We do something of the same sort when we learn a poem by ourselves. We prime the behavior by reading a line, then turn away from the text and say as much of it as we can, then look back and prompt ourselves if necessary, and by looking back less and less often, we slowly vanish the prompts. We refer to the same two stages when we say that education is preparation. Preparation for life was once the phrase. Teachers often forget, however, that preparing is not the same as living. The consequences that do students to come to school, listen to their teachers, watch demonstrations, study, and answer questions are not the consequences that will follow when they use what they have learned. Learning to drive a car is not driving, Memorizing is not reciting, and learning to read is not reading. Students and teachers tend to move too fast to the living stage. The student who wants to be a violinist or a tennis player usually wants to play too soon. Students who demand the right to choose what they will study are also usually trying to skip the instruction stage. Those who criticize programmed instruction by saying that students should learn to read real books also want to move out of the preparation stage too fast. For thousands of years, students studied because they were beaten when they did not do so. The cane and the rod were the tools of the teaching profession. Unfortunately, they have not yet been fully replaced. Much of the time, Students still study, avoid the consequences of not studying. The standard byproducts of punitive control, truancy or dropping out, vandalism and apathy are all too evident. It has obviously been hard to find positive alternatives. Passing grades, promotion, grade contingent scholarships, diplomas, prizes, awards, if reinforcing at all, are not effectively contingent on behavior. Nor has it been possible to make the reinforcers of daily life uh, contingent on what is to be taught, for example, on the basics. 
The primary reinforcer in programmed instruction is of a special kind. Contingencies of survival in the natural selection of the species and contingencies of reinforcement in the, in the lifetime of the individual have made certain immediate consequences of behavior reinforcing regardless of what then follows of biological or other significance. For example, pushing is reinforced when something moves, quite apart from anything that happens afterwards. The immediate effect has acquired the, re the power to reinforce because a great variety of other reinforcers have followed it. Good instructional programs maximize the effect of success as a conditioned reinforcer by asking students to take very small steps and by making every effort to help them to do so successfully. Success is perhaps not a very powerful reinforcer, but it has a powerful effect when properly scheduled. And successful responses, fortunately, occur on what is called a variable ratio schedule, the powerful schedule at the heart of all gambling systems. A similar solution is not available in the classroom because of the basic faults that programmed instruction was designed to correct. Only rarely can behavior be immediately reinforced by the teacher, and the student cannot move on at once to new material. Hence, teachers must resort to some kind of punishment. Such a return to aversive contingencies may be very subtle. A Committee for Economic Development complains that, quote, an alarming number of students leave high school with the idea that the adult world tolerates tardiness, absences, and misbehavior, unquote, and calls for, quote, stringent education standards and tough discipline. Discipline has come a long way from its original association with disciple. It now means punishment, which in turn means more dropouts and more vandalism. The committee seems to be aware of that and adds that it wants to, in quote, encourage maximum creativity in discovering how these standards are to be achieved. In other words, it does not know how to achieve them. To return to punitive control is to admit that we have failed to solve the central problem of education. Correct responses and signs of progress are the kinds of reinforcers most appropriate to instruction as preparation. But other reinforcers must follow if there is any point in teaching. The reinforcers immediately affecting Deborah's behavior as she learned those 15 lines were probably negative. She was successfully fulfilling an assignment. She may have gained a measure of positive reinforcement a month later when, as she reported, she was the only one in the class who could still remember the 15 lines, but that was too late to help in the preparation stage. If she ever recited the lines to herself for pleasure, the reinforcers were those that Longfellow had put into the poem. And those are the kinds of reinforcers that are at work when, if you happen to like poetry, you memorize a poem and then recite it to yourself. While you are memorizing, however, the effective reinforcing consequence is getting the right words out. If you are composing a poem, your behavior may be reinforced if in both ways. A line comes outright and scans and rhymes if it is that kind of a poem and says something you find pleasing or even beautiful. The same thing happens in writing prose. People are said to write articles or books for money or acclaim. Those may be rewards, but they do not occur soon enough to be reinforcers. At one's desk, the reinforcers are the appearances of sentences that make sense, clear up puzzles, answer questions, make a point. Instructional programs in which students complete sentences rather than select them from a set of multiple choices have just that effect. Someone has said that programs that have blanks to be filled are like Swiss cheese, they're full of holes. But when students fill the holes with the right words, something happens 
that is very much like what happens when they use what they have learned. When we are writing a difficult paper and just the right word comes, a hole is filled and our behavior is reinforced. It is sometimes said that program instruction gives too much help, that it does not challenge the student, that no amount of help is too much in the preparation stage. It must be vanished, of course, as other reinforcers take over. The more helpful the program, the more and more easily the student learns. More than 350 years ago, Comenius said that the more the teacher teaches, the less the student learns. But that is true only if it means the less the student learns about learning. Some students profit from bad teaching because they learn how to teach themselves. But good teachers certainly have their place. How to study is a separate skill and it can be taught, especially by a program designed to do so. The preparation phase of teaching raises a standard problem. Teachers cannot teach unless students pay attention. Students who want an education may pay attention for unidentified reasons, and teachers wish there were more of them, but what can be done with the others? Physical restraint is one solution, but a crude one. A teacher in a small private school once boasted that to keep her students from looking out the window when she was teaching them to read, she held her class in a windowless room. In essence, she'd put blinders on her students. In the heyday of the teaching machine movement, a machine was advertised that held the student's head between earphones confronting a brightly lighted page. It forced students to hear and see. Unfortunately, it did not teach them to listen or look. Short of physical restraint is the threat of punishment. A few words are said by teachers more often than pay attention, and they are usually said with all the authority of Achtung, or now hear this. Teachers who have relinquished the power to punish must resort to a pathetic personal appeal. Please pay attention. <laughs> a third possibility is to attract attention. Television advertising has probably exhausted the possibilities. It is assumed that people attend to anything that is loud, bright, colorful, endearing, amusing, sudden, strange, or puzzling, that they will do so at least once if they are shown it many times. Textbooks are often constructed on similar principles with colored pictures and intriguing titles and subtitles. Unfortunately, they have a basic fault. They do not teach students to pay attention to unattractive things. Computers have made it altogether too easy to attract the attention of the students. And the need to teach students to pay attention is often neglected. Students pay attention when doing so has reinforcing consequences. Compare a typical classroom with a room full of bingo players. No one tells bingo players to pay attention nor are the cards or counters made particularly attractive. The players look and listen carefully for a very good reason. Reinforcing consequences follow only when they do so. Well-constructed programs have much the same effect. Children who are said to have a short span of attention will watch a Western on television without taking their eyes off the screen. A book that is not attractive as an object will hold the reader if the writer has filled it with reinforcing things. Not everything we want to teach can be programmed, but contrived reinforcing contingencies are still useful in the preparation stage. How, for example, can we teach the appreciation of art, music, or literature? Perhaps another story will be helpful. In the early 50s, two of my students came to me with a problem. Please turn the continuation of this session. Why they should not use some of the techniques I had described in my course to teach their roommate to enjoy modern art. 
I said I saw no objection, provided they agreed to tell him afterward what they had done. They began by paying little or no attention to him unless he asked about their pictures or sculptures. <laughs> they, gave, they gave a party and bribed a young woman to ask him about them and to hang on his every word. They sent his name to Boston galleries and he began to receive announcements of shows. <laughs> a month later, they came to report progress. He had asked them to go with him to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. He, they went, and when they saw him looking at a picture that he seemed especially to like, they dropped a $5 bill on the floor, and he looked down and found it. That, that $5 bill is worth at least 20 now, remember that. Before another month had passed, they came to show me his first modern painting. Recently, I learned that one of the students was living in New York City, and I phoned to ask him about the project. Had they ever told their roommate what they had done? No, he was sorry they had not. What had happened to him? Well, my student was not sure, but he had run across him recently in the Museum of Modern Art. <laughs> now, perhaps my students had no right to intervene in the life of their roommate in that way, I think they should have at least have told him what they had done. But they had taught him to enjoy modern art, and he was apparently still enjoying it 30 years later. Of course, they had used irrelevant reinforcers. Art is not something worth knowing about because you can talk about it to attractive people or find money on the floor of a museum. <laughs> and that was, a, that was only part of the preparation phase the pictures and sculptures soon took over. Suppose the roommate had been required to take a course in art appreciation, or had taken one as a, part, as a gut course in order to remain eligible for a team. What would the instructor have done to induce him to look at pictures until the reinforcers the artist had put into them could have their effect? Traditionally, he would have been asked to answer questions about artists, schools, periods, subjects, theories, and so on. Answering them would have had little more to do with the enjoyment of art than the reinforcers my students used. And what would the instructor have felt upon running across such an unwilling student 30 years later in the Museum of Modern Art? Would there be any better evidence of successful teaching? Possibly irrelevant consequences can also be used to induce students to read books, listen to music, until the very different consequences that writers put into their books and composers and, and performers into their music can follow. The latter are the consequences that are eventually appreciated. Teachers also go too far in trying to make the preparation stage of learning resemble daily life. They do so when, rather than tell students the facts of science, they ask them to discover them for themselves. That is what scientists do in the real world, and what is then learned is no doubt a more genuine kind of knowledge. But using apparatus and methods prescribed by a teacher is not really making a discovery. It is not very different from discovering the facts of science in the textbook. Students may enjoy a sense of what learning is all about, and experimenting may be more interesting than reading, but it is impossible to learn very much science in that way. Only by designating, designing their own apparatus and working out their own methods will they learn much about making discoveries, and that is very rarely done. Good research practice is a subject in its own right to be taught as such. It is also a mistake to try to make the preparation stage creative. A recent paper in Science reported that only 10% of scientists have done creative work. And the fact was explained by a scientist in science by saying that only 10% of scientists possessed creativity. It would be much more important to know how they were said to acquire it. People who discover or create 
are behaving in ways that cannot have been taught. If they had been taught, we would not say that they were discovering or creating. But preparing to discover or create is feasible. The key word in Darwin's title was origin. The origin of millions of species was to be found not in an act of creation, but in the selection of otherwise unrelated variations. Truly creative persons, if there are any, behave in ways that are selected by reinforcement. But variations must occur to be selected. Some may be accidental, but students can learn to increase their number and in that sense, be more creative. Like all the creative people of the past, they must first be taught something to be creative with. Education is primarily concerned with the transmission of the culture. And that means the transmission of what has already been learned. Educators have turned to discovery and creativity in an effort to interest the student but good contingencies of reinforcement and do that in a much more profitable way. The small computer is the ideal hardware for programmed instruction. It is not functioning as a computer, of course. It is teaching. It should be called a teaching machine. We have flying machines, sewing machines, calculating machines, and a machine that teaches by arranging contingencies of reinforcement is a teaching machine. When computers were first used as teaching machines, their sponsors began to speak of computer-aided instruction. That is right if computers merely help teachers teach, but it is wrong when the computer does it all. We do not speak of computer-aided calculation. We use a calculating machine. With the help of teaching machines and instructional programs, schools can be so designed that students will profit from an immediate evaluation of what they have done and will be able to move forward as soon as they are ready. Those who move fast will cover many more fields, some of them possibly beyond the range of available teachers. Those who move slowly will survive as successful students. Teachers will have more time to talk with their students, and students will learn to express themselves well. They will, of course, have a great deal more to express. Teachers will also have more time to know their students and serve as counselors. They will have more to show for their work, and teaching will become an honored and generously rewarded profession. And because education will be much more efficient, it will probably cost less than it does now. That is not a utopian dream. It is well within range of an existing technology of teaching. Thank you. This concludes his presentation. Thank you.